Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in Junior English. We turn now in our hymnals to pages 1346-1347 and Martin Espadas, Who Burns for the Perfection of Paper. We're going to actually study three poems that are all going to build off the same literary analysis topic at 2B. But before we get there, let's talk about this uh, writer, this poet, Martina Espada, uh, born uh, in 1957. I'm reading with you on 1347. Not many lawyers pursue simultaneous careers as poets, but until 1993, Martin Espada was an exception. Espada was inspired by his father, Frank Espada, a photographer based in the New York City borough of Brooklyn. Father and son worked together on a 1981 photo documentary called the Puerto Rican Diaspora um, um, Documentary Project. A year later, Espada published his first volume of poetry, The Immigrant Ice Boys of Bolero, which was enhanced by his father's photographs. Next heading, Politics and Art. A poet of deep social and political consciousness, Espada draws on his Puerto Rican heritage in his work, as well as his experiences as a legal aid lawyer and activist. His poems celebrate and often lament the experiences of working class people, especially those of Hispanic descent. He has been acclaimed as the Latino poet of his generation. To date, Espada has published 13 books as a poet, essayist, editor, and translator. His many honors include the Patterson Award for Sustained Literary Achievement, the American Book Award, as well as numerous awards and fellowships uh, that, are, that are here listed for you. The Robert Creeley Award, the Patterson Poetry Prize Award, the Penn Revison uh, Fellowship, two NEA fellowships. Espada received the uh, Guggenheim Memorial F uh, Foundation Fellowship in 2006. He's professor of creative writing at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, where he also teaches the work of Chilean poet Pablo Neruda. I like the quote at the bottom of this page. Uh, it's maybe one that will move you as well. No change for the good ever happens without being f imagined first. It's a great, great line. Let's look now at 2B and rhetoric and our literary analysis topic. For the three poems we're about to study, the Espada poem as well as Camouflaging the Chimera as well and Streets, let's take a look at what it is we'll be focusing on. Just as each person has a distinctive way of speaking, each poet has a unique voice. You want to write that word down at 2B really quickly. Voice, literary personality. A poet's voice is based on word choice, tone, sound devices, rhyme, or its absence, pace, attitude, and even the patterns of vowels and consonants. Consider, for example, these examples um, from the three poets we're going to speak, we're going we're to read. Um, Espada, no gloves, fingertips required for the perfection of paper. And then the Kamankara uh, text uh, we'll read here in a little bit. He hugged bamboo and leaned against a breeze off the river. And finally, the Nye line, the sky which sows and sows tirelessly sowing drops her purple hem. As you read these poems, note the distinctive voice each one reveals. Comparing literary works, each of these poets uses personal experience as a springboard for social commentary. Let's get that word written down at 2B as well. Social commentary, a reflection on a public or political concern. In Who Burns for the Perfection of Paper, for example, Espada describes an experience from his youth to call attention to a social problem. In Streets, Nye sets her own beliefs about loss and death beside the very difficult beliefs of others. So as you read these poems, identify the particular brand of social commentary each poet offers. Under reading strategy, we want to draw inferences about the poet's beliefs. And we're going to use that chart there on 1346 to maybe help us out. Also, we want to pay attention to the three vocab words that are provided at the bottom of 1346. We will see those words uh, on the examination. Let's turn now to this very interesting title, Who Burns for the Perfection of Paper. And we're just going to read this thing, and then we're going to pay some attention to what actually is being said, especially in regards to social commentary. So you want to write that down or circle it again on your notes at 2B. What really is being said in this paper? Now, very much like other poems that we've studied, we're going to have a poet who goes back to an earlier time in his life, or her life, to try to understand or comprehend what was going on. Let's go ahead now and read together who burns... For the perfection of paper. Who Burns for the Perfection of Paper by Martin Espada. At 16, I worked after high school hours at a printing plant that manufactured legal pads. Yellow paper, stacked seven feet high and leaning 
as I slipped cardboard between the pages, then brushed red glue up and down the stack. No gloves, fingertips required for the perfection of paper, smoothing the exact rectangle. Sluggish by 9 p.m., the hands would slide along suddenly sharp paper and gather slits thinner than the crevices of the skin, hidden. Then the glue would sting, hands oozing till both palms burned at the punch clock. Ten years later, in law school, I knew that every legal pad was glued with the sting of hidden cuts, that every open law book was a pair of hands, upturned and burning. Okay, so let's start at level one. Before we say anything about the poem, jot down at level one, what is actually going on in the poem? Can you just summarize it? Notice it's a two-part poem. We can say that about it at 2B. We have two stanzas here. In the first stanza, of course, we are first just recollecting back to a time at 16 when he worked at a printing shop where he made these yellow legal pads. It's possible you've seen these yellow legal pads uh, in your life. I've had students who actually never really had seen one of these yellow legal pads. Less and less are they used in high school. You use them a lot, though, um, if you go to law school, or at least that was the way it once was. Now more computers are, are what drive what we do at law school. But for a long time, that's what you did, this yellow paper. We're told about the experience of making these pads and how hard it was at 16. It's very repetitive, long work, boring work. And he has to do this thing where he's got to put the... Um, he's, he's got to work without gloves, and so his hands are exposed, and of course the edges of the paper then can cut his hands in these crevices that are minuscule, and then when he has to use the glue, his hands burn, and of course then that explains the title of the burning for the perfection of paper, because you've got to make it just right with the rectangle, so you've got to firm everything up. The second part of the poem, the second stanza, is ten years later when he's 26, and he's in law school. And Every time that he picked up a yellow pad or every time that he looked at a book, it hit him that somebody had had to do the very work that he had to do. Now that's what the poem is about at level one. Let's now jump to level two and let's ask about some possible themes or messages here about this poem. Well, of course, one of the major messages or themes of this poem is this social commentary. So let's write that down really quickly. What point is it that he is making, Espada is making, the speaker of the poem is making, about society? Can you, can you jot down what you think is going on there? Some students will report the way they like to say it is, there are a lot of people in our culture who have to do the hard dirty work that allows the rest of us to have a great life. Can you jot down really quickly at 3B a single job, a single person that you're aware of who does a job that's kind of low pay, not very celebrated, but if that person stopped doing that job a lot of people would know about it right away. I once had a junior that said, I know who that is in our school. It's the janitors who, if they, if they stopped taking care of our school very, very quickly, we would recognize it and know it. Another student reported, it's the people who make our food, our cooks. If they stopped doing their job well, we would have, I mean, we would know it immediately. It would be something that we would know right away. Of course, another major message of this poem is uh, all the stuff that we use has got to be constructed. That smartphone that you pick up was put together by hands. Unless, of course, it was completely automated in, this, in its production. Somebody had to run the machine, though, that, that put it together even. In other words, there are lots and lots of people who have to work to make the very things. Like, for example what you're holding in your hand. I mean, think about that. What you are holding in your hand right now and you're writing with, that was put together by somebody. Somebody had to put that thing together. 
If you're writing with a pencil, for example, somebody had to put that thing together. If you're writing with ink pen, somebody had to put that thing together. If you're typing on a computer right now, somebody had to put that thing together. The clothes that you wear. Oh, this is always interesting. Notice how this poem leads to interesting social commentary. The clothes that you wear, the ball cap that you like to wear, some human hands had a part to play in that. The sewing, the compiling, the putting it in a box, the sending it away from the factory, the people who put it in the shop, where you purchased it. All that stuff had to be done by people who were probably not well-known and probably not very wealthy. This poem suggests that's the nature of our lives that we live. Final message. These people who work hard jobs demand our respect. The food that you eat is grown by someone who is not a celebrity, nobody famous, and yet those people, because of their hard work, allow your life to be easier and better. At 2B, of course, we can talk about the way in which this poem is constructed. Notice that the epiphany or the realization came years later. Of course, we're concentrating here on voice. And notice how Espada is able to create a certain kind of voice where he says, when I was young, I had a job that was really not much fun. And I got jacked up a lot for it. I did not appreciate what it meant until years later when I was working to become a lawyer. Now let's say it out loud. What point is he making about learning to be a lawyer? Is he going to make good money or is he going to make minimum wage being a lawyer? See how this works? You're like, no, no, dude. When you're a lawyer, you drive a Benz. You get to have a great life. You get to live in the neighborhood you want to live in. Right. So every time he looks at one of these yellow pads, every time he looks at the book, the book in front of you was put together by human hands. Somebody did it. Somebody put it together. The reality, of course, is increasingly in our, in our, in our job and marketplace, machines are, in fact, building more and more of the things that we drive and that we use, no question. But even in factories that are automated, you still have to have humans there who are doing what some would say, repetitive and boring word. They need, their, they need to be respected. Let's jump to three, level three really quickly in the ways in which we want to relate somehow to this. What for you is your favorite song about normal working class people who do normal working class everyday jobs that make life so much better for everybody else? What's your favorite movie that celebrates that? Some professional nobody that does a job but's really important. Do you have a favorite film or song of social commentary? In other words, social commentary here meaning that we need to think about all of the people in our existence who are working hard but usually are unappreciated people. What's your favorite text that teaches you that? Finally, of course, we can ask some three B questions. Why do you think it is the case that we so rarely think about all of the people in the world who have to do really hard jobs so that we can have a good life? Why is that? Is it because we feel guilty if we recognize those people? Is it because we're afraid maybe we'll grow up to be one of those people? We don't really like that idea. And yet, this poem suggests everyone plays his or her role. And we don't appreciate the amount of occupational pain associated with normal jobs that require day to day, day in and day out, hard labor. In your life, let's ask it this way, who is the one person that best represents true hard labor for you? Who is that person? Can you jot them down? Have you told that person you respect them for that work? When was the last time, for example, you told one of the janitors in the building, just walk up to them, walk up to Ruthie and say, I just need you to hear what I'm about to say. Thank you for doing the work you do in our building. 
Why is it that often we look at those people who have those jobs and we maybe even kind of ridicule them in their work? Why is that? That disrespect is an act of a child. Notice here, he really can't appreciate the work he did as a kid until he gets older. Of course, when he gets older then, it hits him. There are a lot of people who have to do a lot of menial labor so that you can have the life that you get to have, the experiences that you get to have. Well, there you go, um, Espadas, who burns for the perfection of paper. Thank you.